Rare is the wine that spends more time in a barrel. Rare are the vineyards that flourish in a more harsh and unforgiving land. Rare is the grape that is harvested by hand and crushed by foot. The wine is port, and this is Ports to Remember. A discovery of port wine from the grapes to the glass. Come, savor the wine, harvest the grapes, get to know the place and the people whose lives have been wrapped in the joy of port wine for generations. Join your host, wine writer and connoisseur Tony Aspler in this celebration of Ports to Remember. After walking through vineyards, it's nice to sit down. And they don't get more dramatic than this at Quinta dos Canais. Stay with me. When Ports to Remember returns, we'll venture through the Coburn Cellar, where time is measured in centuries. Portugal's Douro River flows from Spain through northern Portugal. From the border to the city of Regua is the wildest grape-growing region in the world. The Douro Valley, where port wine begins. This is the Douro Superior, as far from Porto as port grapes are grown. It's a land where viticulture would seem impossible. A place where the contrasts of the rugged valley are extreme. Hot, dry summers, cold, miserable winters. Yet for all its sharp edges, this place is most dramatic. And what on earth would bring people to grow grapes in this inhospitable land? During my visit to Quinta dos Canais, one of Coburn's most remote farms, I put the question to Jim Reeder, the director of Coburn's. He tells me the old viticultural adage, the poorer the soil, the better the grape. This is one of Coburn's most remote grape farms. Jim, this is absolutely fabulous, this view. When did Coburn's acquire the, this Quinta? We bought it just over 10 years ago uh, from a farmer um, who, where we'd always made the wine. Um, we've been making this Quinta for many, many years, and the wines that have come out of it have always been the very best of the Coburn's lots, and in the best years they've formed the backbone of the Coburn's vintages. But we embarked on a program of replantation. We kept the best of the old vineyards to keep the heart and soul of the Quinta, if you like, and to keep the, the flavor of the Quinta as a benchmark for the future. But all this that you see in front of you um, could best have been described as cliffs and has now been terraced and replanted um, to give this magnificent view that you see today. Well, let's go and do some mountain climbing. It's a very good idea. The word canais means canal. The Quinta has a system of irrigation canals built a century ago to water the olive trees. It's against the law, however, to irrigate port grape vines, so today the canals are dry. Some of the best fruit in the, in the Doro area. This must be really hard to work, though. Look at the slope of that. It's like. Well, what is the gradient there? Do, do you know? Well, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, close to uh, 35 degrees. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the steepest terraces, I think, in, in the Doro area. They were not easy to build. Um, and their maintenance is, is, is pretty difficult as well. Um, but we're still on a voyage of discovery with this Kinta, in a way, uh, with the new uh, plantations. We've got what we believe are the best varieties, but you can see how the lie of the land changes, and obviously the altitude changes. And um, it's very exciting because uh, we're still 
finding the best combination of variety and site within the vineyard um, to give us the best wine. Well, perhaps we can actually see them. Yes. This is where we're going to go now, Tony, for the mountain climbing. But the person to take you is Miguel Cotreal, our head viticulturist. Ah, and good. here he is. Miguel, hello, how are you? Very well, thank you. Good. Well, let's good. go up the mountain. Okay, let's go. Out in the vineyard with Coburn's chief viticulturalist, Miguel Corte Real, I find it hard to believe that people actually grow things here and harvest them. Even the truck struggles as we climb. Wow. Beautiful. This is Isn't amazing. It? Now, all of this is, is new. It used to be just, what, slopes here? Uh, yes, it was made in the last uh, five, six years. Before that, it was pure rock and a few trees. I see that along the coastline of the river, there are a lot of trees growing where you are. Did you plant these? Of course, of course. Our main project is to produce, or try to produce the best grapes of the door to produce the best port. But not only that, also, it's our also our project to, to plant and to make one of the most beautiful properties in the door. And the, the trees are very important. For example, olive trees are part of the door. The association between olive trees and grapes and vines are typically from Dord and we, we want to keep that. Climbing higher, I sample olives from the small trees beside the road. The beauty here is on a grand scale. I'd love to come back when these olive trees and vines are fully grown. The dust shows how dry the summer is here. The sun and the heat increase the sugars in the grapes. And when we get back to the Quinta, Jim Reader explains that the heat also has an effect on the wine itself. Jim, I, I want to ask you about the Douro Bake. What exactly is the Douro Bake? And the Douro Bake is an expression we use in the trade um, for the effect of keeping wines in the Douro region rather than taking them immediately down to Villanova de Gaia. And it's basically an effect of temperature. The average temperature in the Douro region is higher than that in Gaia. And it tends to give a more faster maturation with a certain baked um, characteristic. If we are looking at wines for um, the big ruby wines, our special reserve, Anno LBV, and obviously the vintage ports, for example, then we will try and get them down to the cooler temperatures in Villanova de Gaia in the spring immediately following the vintage. But if we keep wines in the Douro region for a year or two longer, then we will get that um, complexity um, of the Douro bake, which can be used judiciously in blends in the older tawnies, and it's coming down always to blending. And that's the sort of thing we're looking for. Stay with me. Ports to Remember will be right back. I'm in Coburn's tasting room with Jim Reeder, the production director. Jim, we're looking at your special reserve. Now, exactly how many wines go into it? A large number. Um, with special reserve, we are aiming for a consistent blend. It's a blend of different years of wines and different vineyards, different areas of wines. Um, and what we're aiming for always is a consistent blend. So the special reserve we've got in the bottle here should taste the same to you today as it does next year and as it will do in five years' time. You would say, yes, that's special reserve. It's exactly the same. And this is the art of blending, is to achieve that consistency of style from what is actually quite a, a, a wide range of raw materials. Of the individual blends we're making now, which are to match... Uh, our previous blend of Special Reserve, we've actually got five samples here, which we're experimenting with. 
But in each of these five samples, there are probably four or five different wines which have gone into the individual blends. So we're looking here at something like 20 to 25 individual wines which are ending up in these two experimental blends. So what we've got um, here are two um, trial blends after three days at work in the tasting room experimenting with different wines to get a final blend which will be the best match for our previous um, batch for Special Reserve. Um, and we're looking first of all at colour. We want a good ruby colour. Ruby colour is exactly that. It's lost the purple uh, of a young wine but it's still red. It's got some slightly brownish overtones and we want that to be the same because that's the first thing that any wine appreciator looks at. And then we're looking on the nose for fruit tones, some berry tones, but also coming through what we call the more mature aromas, which are a chocolatey, slight hint of pepper, um, the sort of thing you get with the age of a wine like Special Reserve. And then finally, on the palate, we want again that chocolatey taste, a certain amount of firmness, smoothness, we don't want it to be rough. And a nice long lingering finish to make people say that's a nice glass of port. So <laughs> those are the two trial blends. Once the blends are made, the wine is placed in barrels and time takes over. Coburn's has approximately 10,000 of these barrels that will be used over and over again for many years. But before the barrels can be reused, they have to be cleaned. At the Coburn Lodge, this is done sometimes with spring water and a length of chain. As port ages in wood, the staves fill with potassium bitartrate crystals, sediment, and other solids that have to be removed. It's hard work. Not only is the barrel rocked end to end, it's rotated as it rocks, so the chain inside can scrape away at all the staves. They continue this rock and roll until the barrel is clean checking to see if the water is clear and repeating the process if it isn't. Most of the port here now will be shipped within 10 years but there's one small part of the Coburn cellar where time is measured in centuries. Coburn's Director of Marketing and Public Relations, Peter Cobb, shows me the family's private collection of ancient ports, a place where moments in history can be tasted again. The Cobbs have been a part of the Coburn Company since 1863. Which she thought might be interesting in a year or two's time. 1955, of course, that was one of the really great years in the port history of port. What, uh, how many different vintages have you got here? I think we've got a bottle or two of just about everything. It is actually a library. We, it's yes. not, they're not commercial quantities here, ah, unfortunately. Now, what's this? This super big bottle here. Uh, well, this is 63 litres. Do you know that, that um, has seven cases of wine in it? Actually, it has a history because it was originally bottled with 1945, which is another great year. And so we took our sort of courage in our hands and we decanted this blooming great thing and um, it into bottles like that here and uh, it was very really good it was marvelous actually it was quite delicious but we still have the same damage on so we thought well the next best wine at that time was 1982 so if you look here uh, yes we um <laughs> we bottled it up with 1982 1982 on the wow. 16th of november 1983 that was when we put it into that damage on thing ah. and when are you going to open it but when you come round next, Tony, I think we might have a bit of a party. Don't you oh, think? I'll be round Tuesday. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> now, uh, 
these do you sell any of the stuff that's down no, here? this is really this is really more as I say a library than anything mm -hmm. uh, maybe the odd case we can sell but mm -hmm. actually although it looks a lot of wine you know it's not all that much I mean oh mind you you couldn't drink all that yourself maybe but nevertheless it's not a lot honestly and truly and what is the oldest bottle you have down here well, I think the oldest and possibly um, I should say the best um, is 1927 um, yeah, we don't have much of that left, unfortunately. But um, we've just got four bottles here, in fact. Uh, we just come to the bin, rather luckily. And it's probably, well, it's the most valuable bottle in the cellar, selling for about, I suppose, if you can get it, about $400, $500 American a bottle, something mm -hmm. like that. Um, and in terms of not only quantity, but uh, quality, but quantity, it was the biggest vintage, the largest vintage that Coburn's ever declared to this day. Wow. Well, I just happen to have my corkscrew in my pocket. <laughs> do, you th do you think we should? <laughs> I, think I'd be, I think I'd be given the sack if I was away from this now. <laughs> so I think I'd better put it back, don't you? Okay. okay. It's a shame, but there we are. Someday, perhaps, we'll taste such a wine. But in the meantime, out in the sun, a celebration is brewing in the city of Porto. This is the day of the festival of St. John, the patron saint of the city, and everyone goes crazy. Stay with me. When Ports to Remember returns, we'll venture through Porto's Bullao Market as the festival fever begins to build. in the heart of Oporto here and the city is getting ready to honor its patron saint Saint John which they will do tonight. And I'm looking forward to that because there are all kinds of traditions that go along with this celebration. That is being hit on the head by garlic most of all. The Bullion Market is in downtown Porto the city across the Douro River from the port lodges. I love the energy in these markets. The vendors won't let you go by without looking, touching, and they hope buying whatever it is they have to sell. And they sell everything. I know a car, somebody who looks just like that. Empty prequels, well. Wouldn't like to eat that thing, I tell you. It looks very ugly. Aha. Uh -huh. Excellent. Thank you. Uh -huh. That is awesome. Good, man. Very good. How do you cook that? Pode ser cozido, pode ser com molho verde, com molho de arroz, filetes, fogo. And what would you drink with it? What what wine would you have? Ah, vinho. 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 Vinho verde. Vinho verde ou vinho maduro tinto. Maduro é mais maduro. Maduro é melhor. É tudo maduro tinto. Excellent. Vinho é preciso tomar o Viagra. If I eat this, she tells me, I won't need Viagra. I should give these to you. The Portuguese love flowers, and there are flowers everywhere. And just for today, there is garlic. Great long stalks of garlic flowers. Not for eating, but for hitting people on the head. It's meant to bring good luck. And it's all part of the St. John celebration. When you run out of garlic, you can always use a plastic hammer. It doesn't smell the same, but it squeaks and we'll hear the sound for the rest of the night. 
Behind me, you can see the old city walls. That's all that's left of those old walls. But this area down here tonight will be party central for the city because two groups will come down from the center of the city. One will go towards Foz in the west where the Douro empties into the Atlantic. The other will party here and watch the fireworks. By dinner time, the city has settled. Well, somewhat. This plaza in front of my hotel will soon erupt in a scene of wild celebration, like everywhere else in the city. The balcony of Coburn's Lodge is an ideal vantage point to watch the fireworks. I'm here on the balcony of Coburn's in Villanova de Gaia with Antonio Grasser, the public relations manager for Coburn's. And the reason I've asked you out here on the balcony is really to find out what the St. John's Feast is all about. You can hear the music in the background. Of course it is. Uh, well. Uh, more than anything else, St. John's Night describes very much the spirit of the people of Oporto. It's a, a town where people enjoy themselves. They, we can enjoy ourselves during a whole night, and yet we are celebrating things which uh, lose themselves in the mists of time. Now, what does St. John mean to the town of Oporto? Well, St. John is the patron of the town of Oporto. Why? Don't ask me, but what I know is that this feast is celebrated in this town for time no end, but it is very, very, very old. What glasses are ideal for port? Well, the best style are those where the belly of the glass is larger than the aperture because that concentrates the bouquet. And you can see that in all of these styles, apart from this one, you'll see that wide base and the narrow top. This one, the bouquet, the aroma of the glass is dissipated very easily. So try finding glasses with this shape, or if you have a real thirst, you can always find something like this. You've been watching Ports to Remember. Join me for the next program in the series.